Reuben Carter was born in Clifton, New Jersey on May 6, 1937. He was the fourth of seven children. He grew up in nearby Patterson, New Jersey, which is a very tough place to be a kid. By the age of 14, Reuben was housed in a juvenile reformatory from which he escaped in 1954 and joined the United States Army where he developed a keen interest in boxing. Reuben was shorter than the average middleweight, but his aggressive style and wicked punching power earned him the nickname Hurricane. Reuben climbed through the boxing ranks quickly. His title shot came in 1964 against world middleweight champion Joey Giardello in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The judges gave the decision to Giardello, but the outcome has been debated ever since. In 1967, when Reuben was 30 years old, he and John Artis were wrongly convicted of a triple homicide at the Lafayette Bar and Grill in Patterson. As Bob Dylan wrote in the anthem Hurricane, the trial was a pig circus, that's pig with a P, he never had a chance. While in prison serving three life sentences, Reuben wrote a seminal work on race and the connection to the corrupt and broken American prison system entitled The Sixteenth Round. The book is also a mesmerizing account of Reuben's battles in the ring as well as in the courtroom. In 1985, after 19 years in prison, Reuben and his attorneys filed a writ of habeas corpus requesting a federal review of the state court's decision. It was a long shot. But for a brief and shining moment, sanity returned to the courtroom and justice was served. Federal Judge Haddon Lee Soroykin ruled that Carter and Artis' convictions were based on racism rather than reason. Reuben Carter, at 50 years old, was freed immediately. From 1985 until this moment right now, Reuben has dedicated his life to freedom and justice, first as the executive director of the Association in Defense of the Wrongly Accused, and currently, as the Chief Executive Officer of Innocence International. In fact, Dr. Reuben Carter holds two honorary doctorates of law from Griffith University in Australia and York University in Toronto, Canada. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Reuben Hurricane Carter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. You're welcome. Thank everybody, ladies and gentlemen, for coming here tonight. And let me clear the air for you for a second. Let me set the record straight. If anyone has come here tonight with the expectation of seeing Denzel Washington <laughs> standing up here rather than little old me, well, I apologize for that. Because Denzel Washington can make anybody look good. <laughs> yeah. You know, since the release of the movie The Hurricane 10, 11, 12 years ago, whatever it was, as I travel the world defending innocent people from wrongful convictions, meeting everyone from presidents to political prisoners, from the White House to the death houses all over the world, People always come up to me, look at me, shake their heads as they're walking away and say, you don't look like Denzel Washington. <laughs> they do. And they're actually being kind to me because what they are really saying is, thank God Denzel Washington doesn't look like you. <laughs> but again, I can't complain. I can't complain because until I saw with my own eye until I saw Denzel Washington portraying me up there on that big screen, man, I didn't know how good looking I really was. <laughs> didn't have a clue. But as you can see later, you know, and, and let me tell you why I say that. I think that every one of us on this planet deserves to have that experience at least once in our lifetime the experience of seeing oneself being mirrored in the eyes of a consummate professional such as Denzel Washington. What an absolute treat that was. And let me tell you why. Years after my release from prison, I went out to dinner with Denzel Washington. It was to be my job, you see, to find an actor to play the role of Reuben Hurricane Carter in this upcoming film being directed by the great Norman Jewison. Now, I had already interviewed quite a number of actors, 
People like Samuel L. Jackson, Lou Gossett Jr., the late Isaac Hayes, Wesley Snipes, Marvin Hagler, the former middleweight boxing champion, and even Spike Lee tried to get in on the deal. And there I was sitting with Denzel Washington. After dinner, I left the table for a washroom break, and when I returned, the actor had also left the table. For just a moment, I wondered if he had walked out on me. But then I noticed him at the front of the restaurant making strange gestures while peering into a mirror. And when he returned to the table and we continued to talk, something began to happen that I can only describe as falling in love. I loved his vocabulary. I loved his attitude. I loved his stridency, and I just loved his laughter. For just another brief moment, I began to wonder if all of those years in prison had finally got to me. You know what I mean? But then it hit me like a double left hook and a straight right cross. When I saw him at the front of the restaurant, peering into a mirror, he was clearing his canvas, so to speak, in preparation for portraying me. And when he returned to the table, he began giving me back to me. And I was loving what I saw. I was loving me. Denzel Washington was only an actor doing his utmost to sell himself for a job that he, want, that he wanted. But my feelings for my likeness sitting across that table showed me how far I had come from self-hatred to the love of self. What a wonderful experience that was. And I think that we all deserve that. But as you can see, ladies and gentlemen, I am not Denzel Washington. I am Dr. Reuben Carter, CEO of Innocence International, a global service network dedicated to defending innocent people from wrongful convictions. And yes, sometimes I've been known as the hurricane. But unlike my four sister hurricanes a couple of seasons ago, and I'm talking about Katrina, Ophelia, Rita, and Wilma, I bring you not destruction, but good news. I bring to you the message that I heard in prison. Not the message of despair, but the biblical message of hope. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. I say that to you despite all of the falsehoods we live with today. The fear, the anger, the hate, the wars, the illusions. The truth will live on because the truth is invincible. And when you speak and act only upon the truth, then you are invincible. I would not be standing here today if that were not the truth. So let me say that in 1966, 44 years ago, for those of you who are old enough to remember, and I see you sprinkled out there a little bit there, and for those of you who are not, in 1966, the United States of America was not as enlightened as it appears to be today with the election of Barack Obama to the presidency of the United States. In 1966, the United States of America was not only at war in that country of North Vietnam, but America was also at war with itself. Segregation, Jim Crowism, and public discrimination was being challenged openly. Every major city in this country was on fire. Africans in America or black people, as we came to call ourselves, 
We're standing up against this institutionalized hatred, demanding equal justice, equal opportunity, equal education, equal jobs, equal housing, and most importantly, equal respect. Every major city in this country was on fire. And all of this domestic violence was being captured on national television and broadcast all around the world. Well, in that same year of 1966, at the age of 29, I was then one of the top contenders for the middleweight boxing championship of the world. I was earning more than $100,000 a year. And 40, 50 years ago, $100,000 was big money. I mean, it's big money today, but it was much bigger money then. I was married to a very beautiful woman. We were blessed with the three-year-old angel, our daughter. We lived out in what was then considered to be the suburbs. We were the only ones living out there, if you know what I mean. I had a 36-foot yacht in the Atlantic Ocean, horses running freely on the mountains. I had a custom-made El Dorado Cadillac. Yeah, my name emblazoned in silver on the side. Oh, yes, and I will admit, I was a neon sign with a chip on my shoulder. But I was at the peak of my career, a professional prize fighter about to fight for the championship of the world. And the next thing I knew, I was fighting for my very life on trial in a criminal court. I was accused of being a triple racist murderer. I was accused, and let me make this perfectly clear, not guilty, but simply accused of murdering three complete strangers in a New Jersey bar. The state sought the death penalty. The odds of me being alive today were not exactly in my favor, if you catch my drift. There were three murdered victims. All of them were white. The prosecutor and his staff were all white. The investigators and police officers were all white. The judge was white. The family and friends of the victims who crowded into the courtroom were all white. The, the courthouse clerk, the courthouse guards, and most importantly, the jury was all white. I, at that time, was black. Even though I did not remotely fit the description of the assailants, even though the two surviving victims did not identify me and even said it was not me, even though I had a number of alibi witnesses placing me elsewhere at the time of the crime, even though I passed a lie detector test showing that I had no involvement, and even though I testified voluntarily before a special grand jury and was exonerated, I was still convicted. But luckily, if you can call the hell of a triple life sentence luck, because I was a successful prize fighter and had the money to pay for a first-rate lawyer, I escaped execution. It was the quality of my legal representation that made the critical difference. It allowed me and my innocence to remain alive. Wow. The problem I had then was surviving prison. And that's an excerpt from the chapter that I wish to read here tonight, chapter four. A little child once said to her father, tell me, sir, asked she, what is the meaning of freedom? And what is liberty? Oh, they're one and the same, my child, but only two ways 
to say one word. But for a better answer, go out and catch yourself a bird. The little child did as her father instructed, successfully and full of pride. She brought a sparrow into the house and sadly watched it die. The child then turned to her father with teardrops on her face. Why did my sparrow die, sir? Didn't he like this place? That's not the point, said the father to his daughter. And I say to you in these few words, no one knows what freedom is, but the lack of it killed that bird. I wrote this poem one night after a visit at the prison for my wife, May Thalma, and my daughter, Theodora, who may have been seven years old at the time. She was three when I was sent to prison. Each month when she would come to visit me, she would ask the question, Daddy, why can't you come home with us? And I would always try to explain to her what I was doing behind those walls, but could never find the right words. This poem came to me instead. It is the only poem I have ever written, as I'm sure anybody who reads it will understand. I realized that the poem neither answered her question nor applied any salve to her wound. But it did make me understand my, the degree of my own suffering and the suffering of other wrongly convicted people behind those walls convicted of crimes that they did not commit. Dostoevsky once said, that to measure the degree of civilization in any society, just enter into his prisons. By this standard, the United States and Canada join a long list of uncivilized societies. You cannot find too many good prisons throughout the world because the model for prisons has become more and more reactive demonstrating the outrage that self-righteous citizens have about the crime of other people. Crime, it is thought, must be followed by severe punishment. The worse the punishment, the better, or kill them all together. Although there were times when the rehabilitation of human lives was the stated ideal of politicians and prison designers, what prison actually does is to destroy families, destroy human dignity, destroy mental health and self-respect. Can a person who hates himself ever be rehabilitated? Can a person exposed to hostility, viciousness, and the calculated disregard for human decency become anything but hostile, vicious, and indecent? A prisoner's life in prison is worth two cartons of cigarettes if he happens to be good looking, and somewhat less if he's not. And if he is not strong enough to defend himself, and few people are, he can be raped and pillaged. Let any part of that prison touch him, and it will spread his poison like, it will spread his ugliness like poison ivy. Let any part of that prison inside of him, and he will have consumed the poison with no antidote. Penal institutions are themselves the cause of recidivism, because the only worthwhile lesson they teach anyone is how to survive in prison. As an innocent but reviled man in prison, A black man convicted of the racist killing of three white people and just narrowly escaping the electric chair. You could have bet your family inheritance 
that I would never again be, be free to see the sun rise. And because of my attitude, because of my absolute unwavering conviction that I was innocent and my supposed lack of remorse, my chances of, living long, of even living long enough to get back in the court was very poor at best. But I could not give in to the threat of violence or isolation. Being found guilty by a jury of 12 misinformed people, a jury fed on lies, a jury fed on perjury, a jury fed on jailhouse snitches, a jury fed on manufactured evidence, did not make me guilty. So I refused to act the part of a guilty man and become a good prisoner. Resistance was my defense. I would not speak to the guards, nor would I even acknowledge their existences. I refused to move to the rhythm of the prison or obey its arbitrary rules. I refused to wear its stripes. I refused to eat its food. I refused to work its jobs. And I would have refused to breathe the prison's air if I could have done so and yet remain alive. What I possess that could never be compromised was my innocence. I wasn't even aware at that time that I had a spirit. But that inner voice, that resistance, shows me as I speak to you today that my spirit was very much alive and kicking. My belief in my innocence and my stubbornness earned me many trips to solitary confinement the black hole of silence. Trenton State Prison was built in 1849. It was a dungeon, and solitary confinement there was six feet under the ground. I spent close to 10 of my 20 years in darkness with no sanitary conditions, no toothbrush, no running water, five slices of stale bread to eat, and a cup of warm water to drink. I ate the bread because I was determined to survive. Morning, noon, and night did not exist for me. Just different shades of darkness, lighter darkness and deeper darkness, but always dark. There's a smell down there under the ground, a smell of body rot and filthy waste buckets not emptied for four or five days. It really was a hole. Every 15 days, we were allowed to take a shower. And every 30 days, we were given a medical examination. Since they viewed me as a triple racist murderer, they were going to try to break my resistance by taking me down to the lowest level they possibly could. They would, have, they would rather have broken my spirit then killed me. But if I died in the process, nobody would have cared, and they would have found an easy explanation for my death. Just as television representations present a false idea of our courts, the public is also shielded from the reality of its prisons. Prison is raw, naked violence, hatred, and bitterness. Every day in that prison, my life was threatened. I was trapped at the bottom level of human society, the lowest point at which a person can go without being dead. Solitary confinement mimicked a coffin. Aside from my innocence, I had nothing else to hold on to but my life. When Nelson Mandela was imprisoned on Robben Island, he said that solitary confinement was the hardest part of his experience. He looked forward to cockroaches walking across his cell floor and climbing the walls so that he would have someone or something to talk to. We used to say that solitary confinement in Trenton State Prison was so bad that even the cockroaches kept their distance. These subhuman conditions take a terrible toll on those who are actually guilty of crimes. But for those who are there in place of the guilty person, 
for those who have been wrongly convicted, every waking moment is pure agony, is pure torture and agony. Why me? The prisoner keeps asking himself over and over like a cancer patient. Prison, ladies and gentlemen, is a society within society that is under the most laws on this earth. There are universal laws that the earth is under and laws of civilization that begin with constitutions and charters that devolve all the way down to mechanical laws, survival of the fittest, the law of the jungle. Prison is the easiest place to hurt others and to be hurt. Prisoners are always engaged in life and death struggles behind those walls. Any kind of altercation or show of disrespect can be fatal, particularly in the morning. Someone may have gotten a letter from his wife's lawyer suing him for divorce, or from his girlfriend saying she's found another man, or from his lawyer informing him that his latest appeal had been denied. When those cell doors open, the place becomes a pit of poisonous vipers. Prisoners may have been mouthing off to each other during the night, but now they have to pay the piper. Oh yes, oh yes, I was angry too. Angry for a very long time. I was eating hatred and victimization as though they were succulent morsels of buttered steak. I was angry at everything that moved. I was angry at the two state witnesses who lied. I was angry at the police who put them up to it. I was angry at the prosecutor who sanctioned it. I was angry at the judge for allowing their testimony. I was angry at my own lawyer for not being able to defeat it. I was angry at my family because they wanted me to quit. They wanted me to give up, to be ordinary like the other prisoners so they can come and visit me once a month for 90 minutes. They wanted me to give up my, protest, my protestations of innocence, the dream of being free that meant everything to me. They wanted me to die virtually and wait to be buried. And who could blame them? Being sentenced to three lifetimes in prison was, as far as the duration of my life was concerned, forever. I had no way out. Even if the system became compassionate in the future, they could only parole me to my next life sentence after 25 years. I was 29 when I went in. After 50 years, they could have only paroled me to my life, to my third life term at 79 when I would then have to serve another 25 years before becoming eligible for actual parole. On my way from solitary confinement and one, to one of those physical checkups in what they call the prison hospital, I happened to pass a mirror hanging on the wall and stopped dead. The grotesque image that glared out from, at me from that mirror shocked me. I saw the face of hatred in that mirror. I saw a monster. That couldn't have been me. Bulging out of his head were two big glassy eyes. The skin was stretched so tightly over his face that it was actually shiny. His lips were thin and drawn back revealing big yellow teeth, rotted gums, and a perpetual grimace of pure sadistic delight. Hatred and bitterness had taken me over. I wanted revenge. In the words of Bob Dylan, if my thought dreams could be seen, they'd put my head in a guillotine. Such a terrible deed had been done to me a deed for which I took no responsibility that I imagined killing millions of people. I was then capable of even that. Solitary confinement wasn't exactly the end of the line. 
But I could certainly see the end of the line from where I was. But somehow, I was able to maintain the irrational expectations that I would soon be released. And with that expectation came the dream of being able to resume my boxing career and even receive a hero welcome back into the ring. Then something unspeakable happened. Boxing, the prison doctor told me, had left me with the beginnings of a detached retina. An operation was necessary. He was a doctor. Who was I to argue with him? But because I was considered a triple racist murderer, the authorities, no matter how much I protested, would not let me leave the prison to go to a proper hospital. Compared to the treatments now available, retina surgery 40, 50 years ago was in its infancy. The prison hospital had neither the expertise, nor the equipment, nor the sanitary conditions to perform such surgery. But so great was my determination and desperation to get back into the ring that I put my natural instincts aside. The surgery was botched. When the bandages was removed, I was blind in my right eye with no hope of recovery. Like Samson, I wanted to flail out and bring the whole prison structure down upon everyone. In prison, that's good water. That's some good water. In prison, you have no immediate outlet for your anger beyond hating your jailers and fellow prisoners. That hate, as I learned, only consumes the vessel that contains it. It doesn't really hurt another soul. There are prisons within prisons, just as there are worlds within worlds. There was solitary confinement. And then there was my own private prison, the conglomerate of personalities that made up what people used to call Reuben Hurricane Carter. These personalities existed separate from each other, ignorant of each other, and reacted to external stimuli just like machines. If I was going to survive that prison, I had to change. I had to rise above the level of a prison. I had to become something different, someone whose behavior was not at the mercy of external forces. The prison itself sure wasn't going to change. The first miracle I discovered in prison is that the only thing that we can change on this planet is ourselves. We cannot change another single thing. You can't change your mother. You can't change your father. You can't change your wife. You can't change your husband. You can't change your children. But you do have the possibility of changing yourselves. And the second miracle I found, and the reason why I'm standing here in California with you tonight, is that when you change, the world around you also changes. It is, in fact, the only way the world can change. And this is what the eye of the hurricane demonstrates. It shows you the changes, and it shows you how we all are very important, and how we all are miracles, really. But we just have to wake up to that reality. I seem to know you, brother. You look so familiar to me. Yes, sir, you do. You look so familiar to me. I keep looking at you, you know? But this is what the eye of the hurricane is about. The eye of the hurricane is about miracles. It's about waking up. It's about becoming who we are supposed to be. This planet Earth is a paradise, a fantasy island. Whatever we can conceive in our minds and believe in can be achieved. My standing here tonight is absolute proof of that. I have no business here, but I am here. 
And the eye of the hurricane tells you how I got here and why I'm here and why I continue to defend innocent people from wrongful convictions. Even with all the high-powered help that I had in my case, the Muhammad Ali's, the Ellen Burstyn's, the Diane Cannon, the Bob Dylan's, the Coretta Scott King's, even with all of that help, I just narrowly escaped through the eye of the needle. And this is what the eye of the hurricane is all about. It's a great book. <laughs> I know you say, yeah, you wrote it, that's why. But I've been trying to get this book out of me for the last 36 years. And finally, I got it out of me. And now I can move on to other things. But this book is important to every one of us in this room. So please read it and have a good time doing it. Steve, thank you. Thank you.